what I would like to, to share with you is some questions and some reflections and see if it has an echo in, in you. So the, the four questions I'd like to address is that why are next stages of leadership urgently needed? The second one is why evolutionary co-leadership particularly? And which integral practices enable its embodiment? And finally, how to scale it up if it's already existent? And there are possibly some different names. So the, uh, I, I like to go back to this uh, curve that Ichak Adesis uses showing that indeed we are going through a metamorphosis at this time. And that, and Laszlo also commented on that. I don't have the clicker working, so, but you can see the uh, laser working, but you can see that we are basically at, uh, and this is gonna be a little more explicit, uh, we have gone through a wave of 150 years, 200 years of entrepreneurship, then management when things got more complex, then financial dominance in the last 30 years or so. Uh, and we are moving into this chaos zone, chaotic zone, where we are asked to reinvent ourselves, uh, not just uh, organizations, but society. And is it possible that to avoid what is already on the horizon, the oligarchy, you know, the government of the few, and plutocracy with the reign of money, and then bureaucracy and possibly disintegration, are there some new forms of leadership that are already emerging on the green curve? So uh, another way to look at it and say, how do we move from this dominant system, uh, command and control, to more collaborative dynamics, knowing that it is not just a question of adapting to complex and fast-changing economy, but also to the desires and motivations of the younger people, particularly millionaires. They don't, work, they don't want to work, as you will well know, in these kinds of structures on the left. So for me, uh, evolutionary, and I'll start with that, uh, is, and you may ask yourself, am I an evolutionary at this stage in my life? And the way uh, Carter Phipps, for instance, defined it in his book that I really recommend called Evolutionaries in 2012, said an evolutionary is a transdisciplinary generalist. He's capable of discerning the deep patterns and integrating what has been separated in reflection as well as in action. So that's a tall order, right? But uh, I learned systems thinking mostly with Peter Senge and some other people, and that's really pushing it in that direction. It lo he looks at reality, or she looks at reality, with a sense of a long, deep time. Teilhard de Chardin was the one to use that word, deep time, have a, having a sense of, because he was, of course, uh, of his discipline, uh, prompted to look at uh, long-term evolution. He or she shows a profound faith in the future and trusts life process. I submit that we cannot go into new forms of leadership unless there is a very deep trust that life is indeed presents us with the circumstances that we need and actually will help us along the way. And finally, he or she experiences himself or herself both as a co-creator and co-responsible for evolution. And when I start working with organizations, and I'd say a few words toward the end about working with benefit corporations in the States, which are interesting new animals on the horizon, uh, that there is that sense of, yes, being a co-creator, but also be co-responsible for evolution. I'm not just doing it for my sake or for the sake of my company. I'm also trying to nudge evolution along in, in, in whatever I can do. So the, from an evolutionary perspective, we are definitely moving, and by the way, I'll be happy to share with you these slides anyone who wants them, uh, uh, from a separation domination paradigm to a partnership paradigm. And I was very much influenced by Ryan Eisler's book on the power of partnership. Interesting, a woman, not a man, wrote about that. Uh, that, you know, moving to the, in the four quadrants from a, an instinctive comparison with the other. Am I superior? Is she superior? you know, a better education, better looks, whatever, ranking ourselves all the time against the others. That's a competitive mindset. Uh, 
which leads in terms of behavior to a high degree of fear, violence, submission, structures that are authoritarian or manipulative in order to handle that, and a pyramidal hierarchy, hierarchy control. You all know all these things well. And not forgetting the cultural aspect, the myths and stories that legitimize all that. As you were saying, you know, we've been brought up with that, and oh, this is the way it works. You can make fast decisions this way, etc. Uh, so, to a partnership paradigm where basically we consider each other uh, of intrinsic equal value. We're not equals, but we have equal value. We are equivalent to each other. That's a very big shift in terms of the way I look at people around me all the time. And therefore, that can move into mutual trust, low degree of fear and submission, uh, flat structures, governance and guidance of the wise, self-regulation that we hear a lot about here, honoring partnership, presenting it as normal. And we're just emerging into that, just emerging into that. There are not that many stories. And that was interesting from that viewpoint, what the panel had to say about that. We need to know more. So then leadership. You know, there is this idea that uh, traditionally a leader is leading, which means dragging people along, or, uh, and in French there is no other words than meneur, which means exactly that, so to be in front. Uh, from, but when you look at it from the Indo-European route, as uh, Otto Sharma invited us to do, uh, and others, that leith means on going forward, crossing a threshold, and even dying. So what it means, am I willing to indeed cross the threshold into the unknown so that something new can emerge, not just the old, not just the, uh, the, the part that, of, that I come from. And letting go of something that we think we know or control or can control, that can be experienced as a form of death. And for many men I know, this is particularly challenging. Very, very challenging, because it's stepping into the void. And so what am I going to do? And that happens, of course, in conversations with my wife. What if I can't do anything? What's going to happen? You know. Uh, so what if practicing co-leadership in the way I define it? I took the root of many words like cooperative, collaborative, communal. communal. They all have this co in common. And that's where this co came from to invite others as co-leaders to cross a threshold together, a threshold together. not just to do it as, a, as the lonely hero's journey, all by myself, right? Venture together into the unknown, the non-familiar, letting go of what we think we know. Trying to sense together what is trying to emerge, and probably several sensitivities will do better than just one and open up a space where both individual creativity and collective wisdom can emerge, can be combined as coming both also uh, as coming from the field. So the, uh, you may have seen that little cartoon. You know, this is just one way of thinking. It's trying, trying to solve my own little uh, labyrinth all by myself, you know, to have a huddle and say, well, how, what do you see that I don't see, etc. And then finally, one person may be able to take that step, but he or she is not the leader because he's on top. He just has a better eyesight or uh, writes better or whatever. You know, it's just locally it makes sense for that person to be there. So that's why I think at this time that uh, evolutionary cool leadership, the way I define it, both transcends and includes the, the best of both individual and communal leadership. And communal means one person, one vote, you know, the cooperatives, etc., which has had great advantages in some domains, but not facing sometimes a lot of complexity. So how can we, if you think of a, the thesis as individual leadership, the antithesis as communal leadership, what if there were a synthesis that is actually emerging now? But we have to recognize that if we use, and I apologize for the, big slides here, a polarity map saying, what do we want to keep? The upside, if some of you are familiar with the matrix, the upside that we want to keep fast decision making, that we want to also have high ownership, you know, and let go of the downsides, the ill-informed decisions, the individual attachments to decision that makes them resistant to changing it. Confusion about goals, the wrong people making the 
the decisions. So, you know, we could go much deeper into that, but the idea is to say, how do we combine both of the upsides into something that is still being created? And that's, if you think of some analogies, of sports, you know, a relay race, uh, a climbing team, a hockey team, is there a clear leader all the time? Or is actually a, a shifting leadership people actually being aware of what's going on in the field or jazz ensemble, theater improvisation, that calls on the same capacity. The movies, you know, I'm, I particularly like the Lord of the Rings as a, and the Fellowship of the Ring as an example of co-leadership. You know, these very, very different creatures uh, being able to work themselves out in very complex, difficult situations, alternating in terms of leadership. And uh, of course, there are some elements of it appearing in the economic domain, exceptional team, as some features of that, collaboration between line innovator, internal networker, and executive leader, when you look at how innovations is disseminated in companies, it takes these three roles. Uh, professional partnerships, some work that way, open innovation with uh, customers and, and suppliers, alliance between company, NGO, and public sector, as I was mentioning, I saw working in, in Africa. And it's very important though to, for me, it was very important to remember that partnership is just not about collaborating with other people, the horizontal part of partnership. It's also a partnership with different parts of self, which are sometimes fighting and then produce what we see sometimes in people's behavior. It's, collab it's uh, collaborating or partnering with nature, with the larger field that is open to us with evolution itself and, and with life's process, with source, whatever word we want to use that. So what does it mean and what are the qualities that are required in order to do that? And definitely we are identifying quickly some second tier qualities, the both end qualities. And I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but reflection and action, body, heart and intellect, uh, presence to what is and view, vision of the future, all these things that normally are part of self-development courses, but how do we harness that in the a, in a sense of this co-creative and co-responsible capacity? And then individual creativity and collective intelligence, etc. So you've seen some of these lists many times, so I can go fast. So there have been a lot of, wor of, of uh, conversations here, but not leaving anything behind, not the head, Sorry, not the head, but also the heart, the hara or the body, right? And for me, actually, co-leadership is based on love, basically. It's, it, it is a love of life. It's a life, love of others as in their potential, sometimes seeing the unfinished portrait in them, etc. So the heart, if, if any, should be uh, in a central place here but you cannot neglect the other things. And I like this little table, which was originated with some, some colleagues. It's not just the I, but the you and I, and then all of life. We can't forget any of these dimensions. Five minutes, thank you. So, we come to the how-to. <laughs> says, okay, oh wow, this is a tall order, you know, so many qualities and so much to develop, etc. which, Many of us, of course, are on the journey, and some of the leaders, hopefully, that we are working with have that too. So, in, um, I, I, for me, just to bring it home, I talk about three dances. A dance with oneself, which I call the inner dance. Uh, you know, you, some of you may have heard of the, 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 the dialogue of voices within. Genpo Roshi initiated that, but some others have picked it up, you know. Uh, the external dance, dance with people that are close to me and with whom I can interact on a, a real, at all levels, including the whole of myself and the whole of themselves. So, therefore, interpersonal and systemic practices. But also, an evolutionary dance. How do I fit as a leader and with my organization into the larger dance that is trying to happen? And what the panel was talking about a bit earlier. So, I'm not going to list them all here, but uh, uh, if we leave one of the quadrants out, we're not doing our job, right? That's really what integral means. So, 
uh, again, not reading all of them, but uh, feeling interconnected, the, the sense of inner dialogue, the staying humble, open, on the, the, the tuning one's instrument all the time, uh, uh, the, the deep breathing, the tough love, the willingness to improvise an ex experiment, all of this is part of that. Uh, and then co-hosting sacred space, practicing impersonality, co-creating through generative dialogue, peer co-development, you know, we could put many more things here. I'm just giving some illustrations. And on the objective, observable side, the high performance team and some of the way it works, the behavioral agreements, the holacracy, sociocracy, some, some of the elements there are very, very helpful. Collective view process, bring the whole system, including uh, the suppliers and customers, etc., in the room, World Cafe Open Space. We can add many more. The key thing is actually to be able to work on all, all of these at, one, at the same time and not by oneself. Yes? And that's where it, it is so important to, to, to do that with others. And I'm just going to say a word about uh, uh, scaling up. My sense, of my experience, is that we want to work with the people that are already innovators or that experience that constructive dissatisfaction with what it is. And that's what I'm going to do with some of the B Corp leaders, benefit corporation leaders in California, where I'm trying to launch a, a, a project to not try to reach all the B Corps, but the ones that are going beyond the statute of you know, reporting equally to all stakeholders, but have the spirit in it. They want to be uh, examples in their community for what, how organizations can be. And so we might ask ourselves, so what are some possible next steps for us? What do we want to do to both encourage this, do this, etc.? And uh, if you want to see no more, there is, the, on the part from my book, there is a, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an article, the Integral Leadership Review in August, and I'm of course, happy to discuss it with you and we'll have some questions maybe at the end. Thank you. Thank you.